Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm David Logan. I'm the chairman of the British Institute at Ankara. And uh, thank you all very much for coming this evening to listen to Professor Eugene Rogan, uh, who is going to talk, as you see, about the Mesopotamia campaign from both sides of the trenches. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, Professor Rogan is the professor of modern Middle Eastern history at Oxford. He's head of the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's. Uh, and is a very distinguished expert on that, on his field. He, as you'll see, is American, but um, uh, his great uncle fought and died at Gallipoli, uh, uh, for, for, uh, and he was, he was British. Um, and of course, that, uh, I think, brings, has brought Eugene over the last few years, particularly in, in, into contact with, with Turkey and, and the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian compact campaign at one end of the empire and, and the Dardanelles at the other. Uh, he, Eugene uh, did his undergraduate degree at Columbia. He did his master's and doctorate at Harvard. And he's been at Oxford for quite a long time now, um, uh, where he has done extraordinary work, which is a, a big part of the reason why the Middle East Center is so well known and distinguished. Uh, his books include, in 2009, uh, the Arabs, a History, which uh, was voted Book of the Year by the Financial Times, uh, The Economist, and Atlantic Magazine. Uh, and now, as many of you will know, uh, he has produced last year this book, uh, The Fall of the Ottomans, uh, which is a, 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 a wonderful history. Um, I think particularly for many of us whose knowledge of that part of uh, the First World War tends to... Um, tends to derive, well, tends to turn on some knowledge of Lawrence and Gertrude Bell and so on. Uh, and this gives a very different perspective. So uh, Professor Reagan is going to speak, I think, for about an hour, and then he will take questions, and then there are some drinks afterwards. Thanks very much. David, thank you so much, both for the generosity of your introduction and for the honor of this invitation. This is actually my second gig with the British Institute at Ankara and for providing a platform for engaged scholarship on issues ranging from ancient history right through to the most current and compelling issues rocking Turkey today. I think that the British Institute uh, stands as a real monument to scholarship and under your leadership has only advanced that, that noble goal. So it's great to be with you all and to be talking about a subject that is so timely. I'd like to take you back just 10 days to start. The First World War was remembered in a small and all but forgotten town on the Tigris just 10, 11 days ago when Turkey's ambassador to Iraq, Sinan Zeren, made his way from Baghdad to Kut El Amara for a small ceremony attended by townspeople and by representatives of the local tribes at the Ottoman Turkish Martyrs Cemetery. We are honored to celebrate the Kut El Amara victory with the people of Kut, the ambassador claimed. These two nations, Turkey and Iraq, fought together shoulder to shoulder and their blood was mixed, like in the battlefields of the Dardanelles and the Caucasus. The Iraqi and Turkish people cannot forget this history. Now, the irony of his words will only become apparent in the course of my lecture. The Iraqi government, for its part, was clearly reconciled to forgetting the Battle of Kut. Their government was represented by no one more senior than the deputy governor of Kut province, who claimed the victory advanced Islamic unity but said little about Turco-Arab relations or their shared experiences <coughs> of the Great War. Yet in Istanbul, the AKP government was outspoken in commemorating the historic Ottoman victory over British forces. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan waxed eloquently on reclaiming Kut for Turkish history. Those who mention our successes in our own past briefly as that they have nothing to do with us or never mention them at all. Both disrespect our forebears and harm our future generations, he said. Kut el Amara victory is a striking example of this. He too exalted the cooperation between Arab and Turk in achieving victory, 
claiming Arabs and Kurd fought as members of the Ottoman army and were martyred for the same cause. In a clear criticism of the pre-AKP Kemalist leadership, Prime Minister Ahmed Daoud Olo claimed, the old Turkey did not want to remember this victory. They wanted to forget it systematically. Presumably, this refers to some privileging of the Dardanelles campaign because of its link to Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. There was no need to pay homage to other great Ottoman commanders, something that the AKP is only too happy to do. The British, too, remembered the fallen at Kut on April 29th. Some 420 men are buried in the small cemetery uh, recently restored by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. It's actually had to be restored twice in the 21st century alone. Those 420 graves represent but the tiny, tiniest minority of the British war dead uh, and Indian war dead, whose graves are preserved by the War Graves Commission, some 64,000 in all in Iraq, scattered over 19 different locations. It serves as a stark reminder of the long and violent Iraq campaign that ran the full length of the war from the opening days in November 1914 to even beyond the armistice when in November 1918, British forces managed to occupy the northern city of Mosul. Mesopotamia was thus the first and the last battlefield of the British war effort on the Ottoman front. In my lecture today, I'm going to focus really on the early part of that campaign up until the fall of Kut el Amara. On the 5th of November, 1914, Great Britain declared war on the Ottoman Empire. At dawn the next day, British forces entered Turkish territorial waters in the Shat el Arab waterway. Their mission was to secure the oil refinery here on Abadan Island, actually right there, and to protect the Anglo-Persian oil fields. The sloop HMS Odin, a sort of hybrid warship that combined a steam engine with some masts and sails, took up positions inside the mouth of the Shat and opened fire on the Turkish gun emplacements on the Fao Peninsula. Right down here at Fao. Within an hour, the fort's commander had been killed, and the Ottoman soldiers, some 400 men in all, abandoned the position. The British landed 500 troops to destroy the guns and establish a secure telegraph line linking Fao to India by cable. The British left a company of soldiers to protect the telegraph station at Fao, while the rest of Baghdad, I'm sorry, while the rest of the brigade moved up the Shat el Arab to secure the oil facilities at Abadan. The quick and decisive action, achieved without any British casualties, augured well for the remainder of the British campaign in Mesopotamia. The Ottomans mounted a counterattack on Anglo-Indian positions only on the 11th of November, inflicting the first casualties on the Indian expeditionary force. The Indian and British troops had to defend themselves in an alien environment that discouraged bold movements. Sudden drenching rainstorms in November turned the banks of the Shat al Arab into a real quagmire of the slippiest mud that soldiers had encountered. While strong winds then turned around and whipped up sandstorms that completely destroyed visibility. And then as soon as the winds would relent and the rains would clear, you'd have this intensely bright Mesopotamian sunshine creating, with the evaporating water vapor, the phenomenon of mirages that totally confused the soldiers in the field. And you'd have all these phenomena on the same day. Uh, it's Edmund Chandler, uh, Candler, a journalist embedded with the troops as an official eyewitness recalled, mirages made it difficult to tell if the enemy are on horse or on foot, or to make any estimate of their numbers. There's not a cavalry regiment with the forces which has not at some time or other mistaken sheep for infantry. Caution seemed to dictate waiting for the expeditionary force to be strengthened with reinforcements before advancing up the shot and engaging the Ottomans for more terrain. Reinforcements arrived on the 14th of November. Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Barrett reached the shot with the remainder of the 6th Indian Division to take command of the Indian Expeditionary Force. With enough troops, both to protect Abadan and to march on Basra, Barrett was confident he could resume hostilities without undue risk. With the Ottomans reeling from the sudden appearance of the invasion force, 
Barrett wanted to strike before the Turks had the opportunity to regroup and confront the invaders. The British attacked Ottoman lines the day after Barrett arrived, so he was quick into action, and drove the defenders from their positions, leaving over 160 men dead on the field. Two days later, on the 17th of November, they engaged the Ottomans at Sahil in heavy rains, followed by sandstorms. Both sides suffered losses in Sahil, nearly 500 British and Indian dead or wounded, and an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 Ottoman casualties before the Anglo-Indian army took Ottoman lines and forced the defenders to retreat to a second line of defense. After a string of swift defeats, the Ottomans decided that their position in Basra was untenable and they abandoned the city. That was on the 21st of November. No sooner had the Ottomans withdrawn than the city descended into chaos as rioters began to loot the shops and the houses of the town. The Royal Navy sloops Espiegel and Odin were dispatched immediately to Basra to try and secure the waterfront until the troops could arrive overland the following day. And on the 23rd of November, General Barrett made a ceremonial entry to Basra when the Union Jack was raised over the city to mark the town's passage from Ottoman to British control. It would never revert to Ottoman control. Sir Percy Cox drafted a rousing proclamation that he, rather, um, that he read to the gathered townspeople in his English accented Arabic. I'll give it to you in English. He said, the British government has now occupied Basra, but though a state of war with the Ottoman government still prevails, we have no enmity or ill will against the populace, to whom we hope to provide good friends and protectors. No remnant of Turkish administration now remains on this region. In place thereof, the British flag has been established, under which you will enjoy the benefits of liberty and justice, both in regard to your religious and your secular affairs. To be honest, Cox's proclamation confused both the British and the Iraqi people. British colonial officials from the government of India were unsure just how much liberty they wanted to concede to the people of Basra. And the people of Basra had absolutely no idea from Cox's proclamation how long the British intended to remain. For many, after centuries of Ottoman rule, it was hard to imagine that the Turks would not return. So long as there remained any chance of an Ottoman restoration, the local townspeople would keep a distance from the British for fear of later reprisals. Once in Basra, the British had effectively achieved their initial objectives in Mesopotamia. They had driven the Ottomans from the head of the Persian Gulf, and they had secured the strategic oil fields from Muhammara down to the refinery at Abadan. Sir Percy Cox, however, made a strong case for pursuing the retreating Ottoman forces. He was arguing for a seizure of Baghdad itself, but was quickly overruled by military planners and the government of India. Instead, the British authorized a limited advance to the town of Kurna. Kurna is at the strategic juncture of the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Shat al-Arab. This would place um, basically all of the vital waterways under British control. The campaign for Kurna began on the 3rd of December 1914, so we really are still in the early weeks of the British in the Ottoman front. Royal naval vessels carried the soldiers to a safe landing spot four miles south of the town of Kurna. As the invaders marched up the left bank of the river, they encountered growing opposition from Ottoman defenders who managed to bring the Anglo-Indian forces to a halt before withdrawing themselves across the Tigris. And hopefully the Ottomans, I'm sorry, obviously the Ottomans hoped that they might gain time by putting the waterway between them and the British forces. But when the invaders managed to secure a pontoon bridge across the Tigris, that allowed them to reach behind Ottoman positions in Kurna, the Ottomans knew their position was, again, untenable. Just before midnight on the 6th of December, a small river steamer carrying three Turkish commanders made its way towards British ships with all lights blazing and sirens blaring to negotiate their surrender. The handover took place on the 9th of December when the governor of the province of Basra, Subhi Bey, 
delivered the town of Kurna to the commander of the Indian Expeditionary Force and surrendered with 45 officers and 989 soldiers, all who then became prisoners of war. What to say of British operations in the Shat al-Arab? They had been deceptively easy. Quick victories were secured with remarkably few British casualties. Fewer than 100 British and Indian soldiers were killed, some 675 wounded in the fighting between Fao and Kurna. The Ottomans, on the other hand, suffered some 3,000 dead and wounded, four times the British level of casualties. So such relatively easy gains gave the British a distorted sense of their own abilities in this battlefield and led them to underestimate their Ottoman foe dangerously. In the aftermath of defeat in the Caucasus battlefields with Russia at Sadakamish in December of 1914 and January of 1915, and after the failure of Jemal Pasha's force to secure the Suez Canal in March 1915, Ottoman commanders in the Ministry of War were determined to make an attempt to recover Basra from the British invaders. The speed of the Anglo-Indian Army's conquest of southern Iraq had caught the young Turks by surprise and revealed their vulnerability in the Persian Gulf region. The challenge was to retake Basra and repel the British from Mesopotamia with the least possible number of regular Ottoman troops. Because, of course, at that point, the Ottomans were really trying to gear up for the defense of the Dardanelles against an impending invasion from the Allies. Enver Pasha, the Minister of War, entrusted the mission to one of the leading officers in his secret intelligence service, the Teshki Lati Masusa. His name was Suleiman Askeri. Born in the town of Pritzrin, today in modern Kosovo, Askari was the consummate military man. He was the son of an Ottoman general and a graduate of the elite Turkish military academy. Even his surname, Askari, means military in both Turkish and Arabic. By some accounts rash and impetuous, Askari devised complex and often impractical war plans and dreamt of glorious victories over the empire's enemies. Between 1909 and 1911, Oscari had commanded the Ottoman gendarmerie in Baghdad, and that experience made him the young Turks sort of leading authority on Mesopotamia. After the Anglo-Indian conquest of Basra and Kurna, Oscari pressed for a counterattack to drive the invaders back to the waters of the Gulf. Convinced he was the man for the job, Enver Pasha and his colleague Talat Pasha, the Minister of Interior, appointed Askari governor and military commander of the province of Basra on the 3rd of January, 1915. And the ambitious young officer set off with his commission immediately. Askari recognized his challenge was to raise a force to expel the British, drawing on a minimal number of regular Ottoman soldiers. His solution, one that was to recur on both sides of the Ottoman front actually, regularly through the Great War, was to try and recruit a substantial force of Bedouin tribal levies from Basra and its surrounding regions. But with little or no time to train his new recruits, Askari was already rushing his force into engage the British in the area around Basra. Unfortunately, within days of his arrival in Mesopotamia, Askari himself was seriously wounded in a skirmish with the British on the Tigris River, just 10 miles to the north of Kurna. This is on the 20th of January, 1915. He had to be evacuated to Baghdad for medical treatment. But the zealous Turkish commander refused to let his injuries deter his efforts. His officers continued to recruit tribesmen to the Ottoman army. And Askari met regularly from his, ho his hospital bed with his commanders to plan the liberation of Basra. Knowing the British had the majority of their forces actually in the riverhead town of Kurna, the strategic junction, of these waterways, and that the region around Kurna was still flooded and practically impassable to infantry. And you can see here on the map the way it's been drawn, the marshlands that would be subject to flooding seasonally that made the areas around Kurna quite impassable and isolated the town itself. So trying to dislodge the British from Kurna seemed to be something of a fool's mission. Oscar and his officers instead decided to bypass Kurna and attack the smaller British garrison at its headquarters in Basra instead. 
Still recovering from his wounds, Oscari returned to the front in April 1915 to command this assault on British positions in Basra. He led a mixed force of about 4,000 Turkish regulars, and anyone's guess, I mean, some estimates will claim as many as 15,000 Bedouin irregulars. As they passed to the west of British positions in Kurna, the Ottoman campaign force was spotted by scouts who alerted British headquarters in Basra on the 11th of April. A combined Anglo-Indian force of about 4,600 infantry and 750 cavalry took up well-entrenched positions to the west of Basra in a town of Sheba, or in Arabic, Shaiba, to repel Suleiman Askari's forces. The Ottomans established their base in the woodlands to the south of Sheba. And Sheba is right here. You see, with reference to Basra. So the idea is to try and bypass Kurna, come around and attack Basra to dry land. The convalescent Askari watched the battle from his headquarters in the woods. At dawn on April 12th, 1915, the Ottoman forces launched their attack. Mobile artillery fired on British positions, and machine gunners raked the trenches as wave after wave of Ottoman attackers tried to break through British lines. As the sun rose in the sky, both armies found themselves firing on mirages, their vision once again being confused by the uh, moisture and bright sunlight. The well-trained Ottoman soldiers fought on with tremendous discipline. But as the day wore on, the tribal irregulars began to doubt, doubt the likelihood of success and began to abandon the field. Suleiman Askari's faith in the Bedouin was then to be disappointed. The tribes of Iraq, it turned out, had little loyalty towards the Ottoman sultan or reverence towards him as their caliph, nor did they see the British as posing a particular threat to their welfare or their way of life in southern Mesopotamia. Many of the Arab rulers at the head of the Persian Gulf, like the sheikhs of Kuwait and Qatar and Bahrain, had actively sought British protection against Ottoman rule. Thus, while the Bedouin went to war with Suleiman Askari and his forces, they did so opportunistically, retaining the right to change sides if fortune favored the British. The longer the battle continued without a breakthrough, the less the tribesmen were persuaded of the merits of the Ottoman cause. The British took the offensive the next day. Without air airplanes at their disposal, they had no sense of the battlefield. And this really was the last battle that a modern British army would enter without the benefit of aerial reconnaissance. Even in the rest of the Mesopotamia campaign, they eventually got airplanes that gave them eyes in the sky. The dust, the heat, mirages, left British commanders in a state of confusion equal to that of the Ottomans themselves. They couldn't actually see the retreat of the Arab irregulars, and the Turks who remained behind fought with fierce determination. Major General Mellis, the British commander, was actually on the verge of retreating when he was given word that his troops had managed to break through Turkish lines. I never want to go through the anxiety of some of that again, he later wrote to his wife. Reports came in to me of heavy losses on all sides and doubt if further advance was possible. I'd thrown my last man into the fight. Still, it hung very doubtful. So for the first time, the British encountered the Ottomans on a battlefield where they actually weren't so confident of success. And given the fog or even the mirage of war, they were just on the verge of seizing defeat from the jaws of victory when they achieved the breakthrough that allowed them to continue. After 72 hours of battle, the exhausted Anglo-Indian forces did not pursue the retreating Ottoman army. Both sides had suffered very heavy casualties in the course of three days of fighting. The Ottomans reporting 1,000 dead and wounded, the British suffering at least 1,200 casualties at Sheba. Though the British allowed them to withdraw in peace, the battle-weary Turks, for their part, did not have a respite in their retreat. All along the 90-mile road upriver towards their garrison at Hamasiya, Bedouin tribesmen harried the defeated Ottoman infantry. The Turkish officers were convinced that they were now being attacked by the same tribesmen who had volunteered and then defected from Ottoman service. For Askari, the perfidy of Arab tribes seemed to have compounded the humiliation of defeat. He gathered his Turkish officers at Hamasiya, 
to vent his rage against the Bedouin and their role in the Ottoman defeat. His dreams of glory shattered. Suleiman Askari took his pistol and took his own life at Hamasiya. Sheba was, by all accounts, a very significant encounter. The Ottomans would never make another attempt to recover Basra, and British oil interests in Mohammara were secured for the remainder of the war. On reflection, British commanders declared Sheba, and I quote, one of the decisive battles of the war. Now, the combination of heavy casualties and the suicide of their commander gravely undermined morale in the Ottoman army in Mesopotamia. Rather than expel the British from Basra, Suleiman Askari's failed attack had left uh, Mesopotamia yet more vulnerable. The Indian army, still at full strength and encouraged by its victories, took advantage of Turkish disarray to extend their conquests deeper into Iraq. The Ottoman position in Mesopotamia had deteriorated alarmingly in the aftermath of Suleiman Askari's defeat in Sheba in April of 1915. Heavy battlefield casualties were exacerbated by high rates of desertion among Iraqi levies, uh, leaving Ottoman forces scarcely uh, capable of maintaining full strength. Ottoman commanders in Mesopotamia had no choice but to go town by town in trying to round up deserters and bring them back to serve on the battlefield. They were, of course, under threat of exemplary punishment. The punishment for desertion was summary execution, but the Ottomans were in no position to shoot able-bodied men who would better serve under arms. Turkish officers, who regarded Arab recruits as unreliable in the best of circumstances, had few illusions about the military value of deserters reconscripted by force, but they were to be surprised by the ferocity with which the deserters resisted recruiting Parter's efforts to reclaim them for Ottoman colors as the largely Shiite towns of the Middle Euphrates rose in a series of protracted rebellions against Ottoman rule. And this was to be in Najaf, in Karbala, in Hilla, in all of the major towns of the Middle Euphrates. While the Ottomans faced internal rebellion, the British continued their relentless advance in Mesopotamia. Following their victory at Sheba, the Indian Expeditionary Force received fresh troops and a new commander, General Sir John Nixon. Under orders to secure the whole of the Ottoman province of Basra, Nixon prepared to advance up the Tigris towards the strategic river port of Amara. And Amara would be right up here, so this line from Kurna up to Amara. With a population of some 10,000, Amara lay nearly 90 miles north of Basra. After several weeks of preparation and planning, Nixon ordered the 6th Division into action under the command of Major General Charles Townshend. To break through Turkish lines north of Kurna, Townshend deployed hundreds of small native river craft as improvised troop transports supported by British steamboats armed with cannons and machine guns. This unlikely armada was dubbed Townshend's Regatta. It set off for Amara at dawn on May 31st, 1915. Between the artillery bombardment provided by the heavier ships and the mass charges from the men in native boats, the British managed to break through Ottoman positions north of Kurna and proceed upriver unopposed by the retreating Ottoman defenders. The advancing British army found itself fighting on friendly territory. Arab villages along the Tigris flew, flew a white flag to demonstrate their good intentions towards the advancing Britons, while the Ottomans' retreat degenerated into a demoralized rout. On the 3rd of June, 1915, the advance guard of Townshend's regatta reached the outskirts of Amara. They found an estimated 3,000 Turkish troops attempting to withdraw in advance of the Anglo-Indian army. A British river steamer with a crew of only eight sailors and armed only with a 12-pound gun cruised up to Amara unchallenged by the Turkish defenders. The sudden appearance of this steamboat under British colors so demoralized the Turks that 11 officers and 250 men surrendered on the spot, while more than 2,000 Ottoman troops retreated upriver. General Townshend arrived by steamer later that afternoon, raised a Union Jack over the Customs House, claiming victory in Amara even before the main body of 15,000 troops had even arrived. 
The collapse of Ottoman morale was reflected in the way hundreds of Turkish and Arab soldiers surrendered to an advance party that they could so easily have overcome. This was an army that had no fight in it. Following the capture of Amara, Nixon planned an advance up the Euphrates to occupy Nasiriyah, thereby completing the British conquest of the province of, uh, of Basra. So Nasiriyah would take us right up to Kurna. Nasiriya was a new town, established only in the 1870s to serve as a sort of administrative capital over the uh, powerful Muntafik tribal confederation. And its population was about the same size as that of Amara, about 10,000. Nixon hoped to win over the powerful U Euphrates Bedouin tribes by dealing the Turks a total defeat and argued that the Ottomans posed a clear and present danger to British troops in Kurna and in Basra so long as they had a garrison in Nasiriyah. They were still within striking, dis uh, striking distance of British positions. So Nixon's forces under General Gorringe began their advance on Nasiriyah on the 27th of June, 1915. The British mounted preliminary attacks on Ottoman positions outside Nasiriyah in early July. Ali Jaudat, a native of the northern Iraqi city of Mosul, was one of the Ottoman troops resisting the Ottoman advance. I'm sorry, resisting the British advance. Jaudat was a professional soldier. He graduated from a military high school in Baghdad and then went on to do military training at the War Academy in Istanbul, the Harbiya. Despite his military training, though, Jaudat had mixed loyalties. He'd grown disenchanted with the young Turk government, and like many educated elites in the Arab provinces, aspired to greater Arab autonomy under Ottoman rule. He was one of the founding members of a secret society established after the 1913 Arab Congress in Paris that called itself El Ahid, or the Covenant. El Ahid was particularly strong in Iraq, where it attracted many of the brightest young Arab officers. El Ahid called for Arab autonomy within a reformed Ottoman state rather than for outright Arab independence because they feared independence would only lead to great, greater European control over the Arab provinces. Whatever his Arabist leanings, with the outbreak of the Great War, Jaudet threw himself into the defense of the Ottoman Empire against the Entente powers with all the loyalty and determination of his Ottoman compatriots. In 1915, Ali Jaudet had served with Suleiman Askari in the Battle of Sheba. He retreated with Askari to Nasiriyah, and after his commander's suicide, was put in charge of an Ottoman detachment near Nasiriyah. The Ottomans were assisted by the powerful Bedouin leader, Ajay Misadun, whose tribesmen filled the thin Ottoman ranks confronting the British invaders. Here again, we have the Ottomans trying to fill their weakened numbers with Bedouin volunteers. The tribesmen asked the Ottomans to provide them with guns and ammunition, and Jaudat was tasked with giving the Bedouin what they needed for the defense of Nasiriyah. When Gorringe's forces attacked the Turkish lines on the Euphrates, Jaudet watched as the Be uh, Bedouin irregulars took the measure of the conflict and then turned against the Ottomans. He saw tribesmen assault Ottoman soldiers to steal their rifles and ammunition. He saw his soldiers falling dead and wounded under intense British gunfire. The Ottoman soldiers are caught between two fires, Jaudet later wrote, from the Bedouin and the British. Isolated from the main Ottoman lines, Jaudat himself was ambushed by Bedouin tribesmen who disarmed him and robbed him before he was eventually captured by the British in the village of Souk el Shuyur near Nasiriyah. Now, judging from Ali Jaudat's experiences, the Ottomans were simply in no position to retain the lower Euphrates against a sustained British attack. There simply weren't enough regular Ottoman soldiers to withstand the British, and the Bedouin would side with whomever they believed was stronger. The Bedouin just wanted to be on the winning side. While it was common for Turkish officers to criticize their Arab and Bedouin soldiers as unreliable, Jaudet's experiences are all the more telling, coming as they do from a native of Iraq with strong Arabist leanings. This is not a, 
a young Turk, this is a, an Arabist. And so his disenchantment with the behavior of the Bedouins was one I thought was more credible than where coming from uh, an Anatolian Turk. The British attack on Nasiriyah opened on the 24th of July with salvos of artillery fired from steamships. British and Indian troops then stormed the defenders' trenches in waves of bayonet charges. The Ottomans held their ground, forcing the invaders to fight for every inch, but the fighting went on until nightfall. The Turkish defenders, having suffered over 2,000 casualties and losing 950 soldiers taken prisoner, withdrew under cover of darkness. At dawn the next morning, a delegation of townspeople rode out to the British boats to tell them to stop firing and to deliver the city to the British. After suffering heavy casualties of their own, the British were relieved not to have to fight another day. So with the occupation of Nasiriyah, the British had secured the entire Ottoman province of Basra within sort of the, the boundaries established within the Ottoman administration. But there was that drive that comes with taking towns that made the British commanders look to the next strategic town they might want to take. General Nixon immediately wanted to press on to take the strategic town of Kut el Amara. Right up here. Situated in a bend in the Tigris, Kut was the terminus of the Shat el Hai channel see the Shat el Hai traced here, which links the Tigris to the marshlands and ultimately to the Euphrates, depending on the season, of course. There were times of the year when the Shat el Hai was not navigable, but um, at any rate, perceived by British planners to be a strategic asset that to secure their positions in Amara and in Nasiriya required the taking of Kut. The Anglo-Indian troops had gained in experience. They also had the self-confidence that came with having won a string of victories. Given time to recover from their fevers, even General Townshend suffered uh, illness after the conquest of Amara and had to return to India for a period of convalescence. Nixon was confident that his soldiers could resume their seemingly unstoppable advance of the Tigris and proposed waiting until September 1915 to launch his assault on Kut. The Viceroy in India, Lord Harding, gave his approval for the next stage of the Mesopotamia campaign. The conquest of Kut was to be led by General Townshend, whose regatta had so effortlessly taken Amara. But Townshend had grave reservations about extending British lines. Where are we going to stop in Mesopotamia, he fretted. And his concerns were well-founded. After nearly a year in Mesopotamia, the Indian army needed reinforcements, needed reinforcements badly. And Townshend worried about his supply lines as British forces advanced ever deeper into Mesopotamia. Each conquest extended lines of communication that were entirely dependent on river transport. There were no roads for the men to move up and down between their different towns. The riverboats available to the Indian army simply were not fit for purpose. Doubling the length of the supply line from Basra without adequate transport placed the entire expeditionary force at risk. But Townshend accepted his orders from Nixon to lead the advance on Kut and began his march upriver on the 1st of September, 1915. Townshend had more grounds for concern than he realized at the time. The Ottomans had just appointed a new commander to their forces in Mesopotamia. Nuruddin Bey was a fighting general who had served in the Ottoman-Greek War of 1897 and had suppressed insurgencies in both Macedonia and in Yemen before the outbreak of the Great War. As one military historian concluded, the multilingual Nuruddin, who spoke Arabic, French, German, and Russian, was an exceptionally talented Tasked with protecting Baghdad from the Indian army, Nur Adin worked tirelessly to rebuild his depleted divisions and managed to draw new units to Mesopotamia. So a dangerous new dynamic was transforming the Mesopotamia front to Britain's disadvantage. Ottoman numbers were expanding while British numbers were progressively depleted. 
In the end, though, the British did not force, or rather the Turks did not force the British to fight for Kut. British aerial reconnaissance reported that the Ottomans had abandoned Kut and completed an orderly retreat upriver towards Baghdad at the time that Townshend was marching with his forces to take the town. On the one hand, this was good news, as the British could occupy Kut el Amara in October 1915 unopposed. But in victory, Townshend had failed. The Ottomans had slipped his net and retreated with their artillery and all of their forces intact. Each time the British failed to surround and destroy the Mesopotamian army, the Turks were given the opportunity to regroup, drawing the Indian army ever deeper into Iraq, further extending its lines of supply and communications. The Indian expeditionary force then grew more vulnerable with every battle it won in Iraq. The British victory at Kut in October 1915 coincided with the growing recognition in London that the Dardanelles campaign had failed. Many politicians feared the adverse consequences of a British defeat in Gallipoli on their standing in the Muslim world. The British cabinet believed that failure in the Dardanelles would deal a propaganda victory to the Ottomans and their jihad politics, destabilizing Britain's position in both India and in Egypt for fear that Muslims in those countries might respond to the Ottoman declaration of jihad, creating uprisings in the empire that would weaken the British war effort on the Western Front as well as in the Ottoman Front. Inevitably, some politicians came to see the occupation of Baghdad as a remedy for the reputational risks of evacuation from Gallipoli. The commanders in the field, however, were of two minds. General Nixon not only believed his forces could take Baghdad, but he believed that they would only be safe in Mesopotamia once they did. The cautious General Townshend, who'd led the 6th Pune Division to victory in Amara and Kut, argued that the British should focus on consolidating their gains in the territories they securely held. While his soldiers could quite possibly take Baghdad, they'd need significant reinforcements to hold the city and to assure the lines of communication stretching hundreds of miles along the fickle Tigris from Baghdad to Basra. An influential troika of ministers, including Foreign Secretary Lord Grey, Arthur Balfour, and Winston Churchill, agreed with Nixon and called for a full occupation of Baghdad. The politicians saw in Baghdad an opportunity for a great success such as we had not yet achieved in any other quarter and the political and even military advantages which would follow from it throughout the East could not easily be overrated. It's very interesting the way the politicians put the political ahead of the military when thinking of the gains that Baghdad would represent to them. The Secretary of State for India, Austin Chamberlain, conceded, and with the Cabinet's blessing sent a telegram to Lord Harding on October 23rd, giving General Nixon authorization to advance onto Baghdad, promising to dispatch two Indian divisions from the Western Front in France to Mesopotamia as soon as possible. British commanders had no reliable information on Ottoman numbers defending Baghdad. Estimates of Turkish numbers ranged from 11 to 13,000 men. In early November, Nixon and Townshend began to receive a number of contradictory reports of Ottoman reinforcements sent from Syria or the Caucasus to Baghdad, but they just disregarded them as unreliable intelligence. Nixon and Townshend assumed their numbers were either at parity or only slightly less than Ottoman numbers. However, their experience of Turkish defenders collapsing under pressure gave British commanders the confidence that they could prevail even against slightly larger Turkish numbers. On the eve of battle, Townshend ordered two aircraft aloft for a last long-range overview of the enemy's position. The first pilot covered his area and returned safely, reporting no changes in Ottoman lines. The second pilot, flying to the east of Ottoman lines in Ktesiphon or Salman Pak, was troubled by significant changes on the ground and evidence of considerable reinforcements. As he circled back for a closer look, 
Ottoman troops shot holes through his engine, forcing the pilot to land behind enemy lines, where he was taken prisoner. Though the pilot refused to answer his captors' questions, they took the map on which he'd marked their positions of the 51st Division, the first reliable intelligence the British had of Ottoman reinforcements in the Mesopotamian front. As a Turkish officer recorded, the map containing this priceless information fell not into the hands of the enemy commander, but into those of the Turkish commander. The downing of the British plane, and we only know this story from Ottoman sources, not only prevented Townshend from learning that his troops were actually dangerously outnumbered by the Turks, a force of over 20,000 men, but it also did a great deal to raise morale among Turkish troops. This little event was taken for a happy omen, Turkish commander wrote, that the luck of the enemy was about to change. And indeed, so it was. In the early morning hours of November 22nd, the British moved against the Ottoman front line at Salman Pak or Ketesifan. And here we've got a map that will situate British positions in Kut el Amara, the uh, Ketesifan lines defending Baghdad, and the city of Baghdad itself. You could see why, being in a strong position in Kut, this was just too tempting for British commanders looking for a quick and easy victory to make up for losing in Gallipoli. In the early morning hours of the 22nd of November, the British moved against Ottoman front line at Salman Pak, or Ketesifan. It's an interesting play with names here. The British, ever concerned for the sensibilities of Muslim soldiers in the Indian army, discouraged reference to the town by its Turkish name. Salman Pak, Salman the Pure, was of course the Prophet Muhammad's barber. And Salman Pak was a place where legend maintains this companion of the Prophet Muhammad was buried. The British insisted that the town be referred to by its Sasanian name of Ketesifon, giving a pre-Islamic classical reference that they hoped would dilute any such religious feeling. So as the British moved against Ketesifon, the last Ottoman position before Baghdad, four columns of troops advanced under the mistaken belief that they still enjoyed the element of surprise. The illusion was quickly shattered as the defenders opened fire with machine guns and artillery as the British came into range. Almost directly under fire from guns, Captain Leckie recorded in his diary, along with the names of his comrades killed in that first onslaught, rifle fire incessant until about 4 p.m., fighting very severe. The British and Ottomans engaged in bayonet charges and hand-to-hand -hand combat for hours before the British finally took the Ottoman frontline trenches. But no sooner had the British secured the front then the Ottomans mounted a fierce counterattack with some of their most experienced troops from the first, 51st Division. The fighting raged well into the night as casualties soared on both sides. For three days, the Ottomans held the Anglo-Indian army at bay. The British managed to retain the Ottoman front line, but lacked the troops to overwhelm the defenders in the second line of trenches. The number of untreated wounded posed a growing problem for the British in particular. The Ottomans, of course, were able to recover all their wounded and send them upriver to Baghdad for treatment. There was no such hinterland for the British to fall back on. The British hadn't anticipated such heavy casualties and were woefully unprepared to treat the thousands of grievously wounded soldiers. And, and I have cut out of my talk the accounts left by British participants of just how horrible the suffering of the wounded were under the very um, unprepared conditions of that battlefield. By November 25th, Townshend and his commanders recognized their position was untenable. The Indian army was outnumbered and it was overextended. They had gone to battle with a fixed number of troops. They had no reserves to back them up. The earliest reinforcements, reinforcements would not reach Mesopotamia before January. They had to preserve as many able-bodied soldiers as possible to defend British positions between Basra and Kut el Amara, and they had to evacuate the wounded as a matter of urgency. Townshend needed every riverboat at his disposal to carry the thousands of wounded downstream, leaving the able-bodied exhausted after three days of intense fighting 
to undertake what was every soldier's worst nightmare, a retreat under full enemy fire. After a relentless week of marching under fire, the weary Indian and British soldiers filed into the familiar streets of Kut el Amara on the 2nd of December, 1915. Situated in a horseshoe bend of the Tigris, Kut was a prosperous town. The center of the local grain trade, it also had an international trade in licorice root. Its mud brick courtyard houses stood several stories tall with intricate carved wooden decorations. Among its larger public buildings were two mosques, one reportedly with a very fine minaret, government offices, and a large covered market that the British were to convert into a military hospital. A mud brick fortress dominated the river to the northeast of the town, and you can see it here on the map. And that became the cornerstone of the British line of defense stretching across the neck of the peninsula on the left bank of the Tigris River. So you can see the British basically drew a line from the fort right across the neck of the peninsula of Kut to create their lines of defense. Some of Townshend's officers questioned the wisdom of retiring to Kut. Given its location, the town was certain to be surrounded and besieged by the Ottoman forces. This placed not just the Indian army, but the civilian population of Kut in mortal danger. While the townspeople had surrendered to the British without a fight, their cooperation could not be relied on under the conditions of a prolonged siege. Weighing the alternatives of expelling the civilians with the ensuing humanitarian crisis of making 7,000 people overnight homeless, um, and forcing the residents to share in the hardships of a siege, Townshend and his commanders took the fateful decision that leaving the residents of Kut in their homes would be the lesser of two evils. How wrong they would be proved. Townshend accepted the inevitability of a siege, believing that it would be of short duration. The survivors of Salman Pak combined with the garrison at Kut, gave Townshend a force of about 11,600 combatants and about 3,315 supportive non-combatants. They had about 60 days rations. He was confident that his troops could withstand a few weeks of siege until the promised reinforcements reached Mesopotamia in January to relieve his position and resume the march of triumph up the Tigris. The Turkish advance guard reached Kut on the 5th of December. Nur ad-Din Pasha's forces began to take up positions around the town immediately thereafter. And by the 8th of December, the Ottomans had succeeded in encircling Kut. The Ottomans, after a year of losing ground to the Anglo-Indian army in Mesopotamia, had turned the tide of battle. The dangers of life under siege were immediately apparent to the defenders in Kut, who must have felt like proverbial fish in a barrel. The Turks set about drenching the place with shells. G.L. Haywood, a junior officer attached to the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, recalled. And when they got closer, they swept all the flat ground with machine gun fire. From this day, the riverbank sniping also got serious. So as the British struggled to deepen their trenches against the relentless fire, the Ottomans drove their saps ever closer to the British lines. During these early weeks, the Turks made no actual assault, but they got up very close, and we had some rather anxious nights, Haywood confessed, as Turkish lines reached to within 100 yards of British positions. It wasn't until Christmas Eve that the Ottoman commander, Nur ad-Din Bey, launched his attack on Kut. Artillery blew great holes in the mud brick walls of the fortress as British and Indian troops struggled desperately to repel waves of determined Turkish infantry charging their trenches. The casualties were intense on both sides, but as was so often the case in the Great War, the casualties were heaviest among the attackers. As dawn broke over Kut on the Christmas morning, Turkish dead and wounded lay in piles stretching from British trenches back to Ottoman lines. Many of the British survivors wrote of their attempts to try and get to the Turkish wounded, who were trapped beneath the gunfire between enemy lines. 
In the end, the best they could do was throw bread and water bottles to those soldiers within reach and then listen to the groans of the injured until, with time, death brought quiet to the horrible battlefield. Within weeks, many of the Ottoman dead still lay where they'd fallen on Christmas Eve. After the battle of the 24th of December, Nur ad-Din Bey made no further attempt to storm British positions. He just ordered the tightening of the siege instead, cutting Kut off from all supply lines and subjecting the fortified areas to sustained artillery, machine gun, and sniper fire. Over the month of February, waves of Indian army reinforcements were shipped from France to Basra to join the Mesopotamian expeditionary force. And they arrived piecemeal, often separated from their cannons or from their horses, all in the haste of their transport. And the docks in Basra were terribly ill-suited to meet the demands of a, of a full expeditionary army. Um, Basra turned the whole thing into a bottleneck where units were held up for weeks while trying to sort their guns and horses before setting off for the front. Inadequate river transport meant that most troops had to march the 200 miles from Basra to the front. So here, down in Basra, going up the Tigris until they reached Sheikh Saad, which was the British front line since the fall of, or the siege of Kut el Amara. In this way, General Aylmer, commander of the relief force, received the two divisions he'd been promised to reinforce his depleted ranks, but far too slowly and far too unevenly to achieve the, to achieve the numerical superiority over Turkish forces that would allow him to relieve Kut el Amara. Aylmer faced a very difficult decision. Ideally, he'd wait until all of his reinforcements arrived, sorted out their artillery, and could move as one large body to confront the Turkish lines. But with each passing week, fresh Ottoman troops, relieved from the defense of the Dardanelles since the British evacuation, were now reinforcing the 6th Army in Mesopotamia. And at the same time, a whole part of the strategy of the relief column was you had nearly 12,000 men penned up in Kut, who, once the relief army was in striking distance, could burst out from their own lines to join up with the relief column and make common cause against the Ottomans who were laying siege to them. But with each passing week, um, Townshend and his men grew sicker and weaker through the shortage of food and of medicine. So Elmer's dilemma was to try and pick the optimal moment when his forces would be at the greatest possible strength before the Turks grew yet stronger to try and make um, a, a suboptimal but victorious drive on Turkish lines. He chose to resume the offensive in early March 1916 as the siege entered its third month. Aylmer proposed a bold surface attack, I'm sorry, a bold surprise attack overland towards the Shatil Hai Channel to the south of Kut. So rather than trying to move, I'm sorry, rather than trying to move upriver and confronting Ottoman lines head on, drive a line straight across the desert badlands to attack Ottoman positions guarding the entrance to Kut El Amara and breaking through Ottoman lines here. So to preserve the elements of surprise, Elmer wanted to march his troops overnight to strike here at the Dujela Redoubt at dawn. With that vantage point secured, he hoped to open a safe passage for Townshend's forces from the southern reaches of Kut across the Tigris to break out and link up with the relief column. And had Elmer's troops succeeded in this plan, they might very well have won for the Turkish lines at Dujela were all but abandoned on the night of the 7th of March when the Tigris Corps set off for battle. The problem was, this is all unmarked territory. And the British soldiers crossing unfamiliar terrain in the dark of night got terribly disoriented and got lost. At sunrise on the 8th of March, the attackers found themselves still a good 4,000 yards from the Dujela Redoubt. The British commanders assumed the Ottomans would have seen their columns arriving across the flat ground 
in the early dawn light. So now Aylmer believes that his troops have lost that critical advantage. Surprise. He feared his men would then be exposed to heavy gunfire from Ottoman lines he imagined to be fully manned. But the British commander didn't realize what that the Turkish trenches in Dujela were empty and that the Ottomans were totally unprepared to repel his attack. Aylmer knew from bitter experience how many casualties he risked in storming well-entrenched Ottoman lines over flat ground. If you ran men across flat ground into machine gun and artillery fire, thousands died. He ordered his officers to hold their troops back and to subject the Ottoman positions to an intense artillery bombardment to silence Turkish guns before ordering their men to attack. British gunners opened fire at 7 a.m. and kept up their bombardment for three full hours. Alas, instead of protecting his men from enemy fire, the barrage alerted Ottoman commanders of an imminent attack where at least they expected one, and they flooded Dujela with troops. By the time the British were ordered into battle, the empty trenches of Dujela had been filled. Ali Hassan Bey was the commander of Ottoman forces to the south of Kut. He'd arrived from the Caucasus in February of 1915 and had spent his first month in Mesopotamia drilling his battle-hardened veterans to fight in this alien new environment. He'd gone to bed on the 7th of March with no reports of unusual activity from the enemy. He was first advised of the British offensive early the next morning when one of his battalion commanders informed him of the artillery barrage. As soon as he realized the gravity of the situation, Ali Song conferred with the commanders of his mountain artillery and machine gun companies. He showed them the location of British forces on a map. I told them to answer the enemy artillery and to fire on any enemy troops as they marched. He then gave orders to the commander of the Ottoman 35th Division, a unit made up entirely of Iraqi conscripts whose <laughs> discipline, order, and training he doubted. They were instructed to fight to the last man in defense of their positions. I told them that I'd execute anyone who attempted to run away, and knowing of my reputation from the Caucasus front, everyone believed me. He placed his trusted Anatolian soldiers at the very center of the redoubt, confident that they'd hold their line. Ali Hassan Bey threw every unit under his command into Dujela while the British artillery kept up their barrage, and it must have been hell to be running as a foot soldier right into the barrage of artillery that the British were sending over the lines in Dujela. The enemy did not send their infantry forward while their artillery was firing on us, the Ottoman commander noticed. We benefited from this mistake, and all our troops managed to arrive at the redoubt to be in position before the British launched their infantry assault. Ali Sabih Bey then expressed his full gratitude to the British generals for giving him three hours to get his men into position. Abedin Ege was a veteran of the Gallipoli campaign, whose unit had been deployed to Mesopotamia following the British uh, withdrawal. He was in the Ottoman front line when the British infantry began their charge. He watched as thousands of English and Indian soldiers crossed the plain, wondering how he could stop so many attackers with only the one battalion under his command. The distance between us and the enemy was only 800 meters, he wrote. Both sides started firing and the battle began. The enemy made every effort to reach us, but their forces were melting under the heat of our fire. And of course, Turkish casualties were mounting as well, as Ege reported martyrs falling all around him. But they succeeded in holding their lines until reinforcements arrived that afternoon. By evening, the British could no longer sustain the attack and withdrew. We had an absolute victory against the enemy, Ege boasted, but we lost half our battalion. The assault on Dujela, known to the Turks as the Battle of Sabis Hill, was a crucial victory for the Ottomans. British casualties were nearly three times higher than Ottoman losses, and the magnitude of the Ottoman victory proved a tremendous boost to Turkish morale and left the British despairing of ever relieving Townshend and his increasingly weakened army in Kut. The Ottoman commander-in-chief, Halil Bey, tried to capitalize on the collapse of the defenders' morale. And on the 10th of March, Halil sent a message to General Townshend inviting him to surrender. You have heroically fulfilled your duty, Halil wrote in French. 
From henceforth there is no likelihood you will be relieved. According to your deserters, I believe that you are without food and that diseases are prevalent among your troops. You are free to continue your resistance at Kut or to surrender to my forces, which are growing larger and larger. Now, needless to say, Townshend declined Halil Pasha's kind offer, but it did make him think. In his report to London, the British commander in Kut asked permission to enter negotiations with the Turks if there were any doubt of his position being relieved by the 17th of April, the date by which he calculated the last of his food supplies would have been depleted. The relief column under Elmer continued to make every effort to relieve Kut, but with diminishing success. On the 17th of April, the day when Townshend had calculated his food supplies would be depleted, the British attack on Ottoman positions in Beit Issa was driven back by an overpowering Ottoman counterattack. So Beit Issa is right here. You can see they resumed trying to do the frontal assault and were just hit with very strongly entrenched forces in Beit Issa. The enemy withdraws and we pursue them. We advanced until we reached the enemy's main trenches, Abedin Ege wrote. Checked at Beit Issa, the, reforce, uh, the relief force made its final assault on April 22nd with a bloody attack on Ottoman lines in Sinayat. Sinayat is actually a position behind um, Beit Issa. So they've been driven back and we're trying to break through a position here. By late afternoon, both sides called a truce to recover their wounded. The uh, recovery operations went on till sundown as both Turkish and British stretcher bearers struggled to try and bring all their wounded in from the field. It was as though both sides recognized that the time for hostilities had ended. In four months of fighting to try and free the 13,000 troops trapped in Kut, the relief force had itself suffered 23,000 casualties. On the 22nd of April, the generals called a halt to operations. Their exhausted and demoralized troops could do no more. The fate of Townshend's besieged soldiers was sealed as their food supplies were depleted. Death or unconditional surrender. And of course, Townshend chose the latter. The starved and emaciated soldiers in Kut assembled at midday on the 29th of April 1916 to face their captors. And you really can see in this photograph of a group of sepoys, these were actually exchanged with the British and so were photographed by the British uh, once they'd gone behind lines. But their suffering is really etched on their bodies. So ended the long period of fighting, waiting, and hoping, suspense and anxiety and starving, Major Alex Anderson wrote. The impossible and unthinkable had happened, and one felt stunned. But there was some sense of relief mixed with the shock. After 145 days under siege, relentless gunfire, and progressive starvation, the British and Indian soldiers were glad to be at the end of that ordeal. They imagined conditions as prisoner of war could be no worse than what they'd already endured. And for the common British soldier, of course, it was to prove far worse indeed. But here we also had the photograph of Townshend with Halil Pasha on the day that he surrendered at Kut el -Amara. Now, depression on the British side was, of course, matched by elation in Turkish lines. Everyone is smiling with joy and happiness, Abedin Ege, our Gallipoli veteran, recorded in his diary on the 29th of April. Today was declared the Kut Bayram, or the Kut holiday, and will henceforth be a national holiday. So indeed, one century later, as the AKP remembers the victory at Kut, they are in some sense reviving something which the Ottomans had hoped would be a national holiday for generations to come. Abedin Ege marveled at the scale of the Ottoman victory, taking five generals, 400 officers, and nearly 13,000 men prisoner. He wrote, the English have never faced such a defeat anywhere. And Ege's claims were actually quite accurate. At 13,309 men in total, Kut was the worst surrender the British army had ever suffered. 277 British officers, 204 
Indian officers, 2,592 British soldiers, 6,988 Indian soldiers, and 3,248 Indian support staff. The end of the siege brought only horror to the townspeople of Kut. Suspected of collaboration with the British occupiers, the Ottomans treated the, their citizens in Kut to summary justice. The British chaplain at Kut reported that many of those suspected of working with the British were hanged on tripod gallows and, quote, left to be slowly strangled to death. These people were various Jews or Arabs who had interpreted for us or who the Turks imagined had given us assistance in various ways. Among them were the Sheikh of Kut el Amara and his sons, all strung up on the gallows. A British artilleryman, another diarist who I found so valuable in writing my history, Gunnar Lee, was appalled by, quote, the crying and awful wailing of the Arab women and children in the days after the Ottoman entry to Kut. By the time the British troops were marched out of Kut four days later, one officer claimed that half the town's inhabitants had been shot or hanged and the trees were dangling with corpses. The fate of the townspeople of Kut, who suffered the dangers of gunfire and the pains of starvation alongside the British, lends a terrible irony to the Turkish ambassador's reflections in Kut just 10 days ago. These two nations, Turkey and Iraq, fought together shoulder to shoulder and their blood was mixed. The Iraqi and Turkish people cannot forget this history. Perhaps it is because the Iraqi people have remembered their history that their response to the Turkish commemorations proved so muted on the 29th of April. In Britain, news of the surrender at Kut provoked nothing short of a political crisis. Coming so soon after the failure in Gallipoli, the fall of Kut redoubled pressure on the Asquith government to convene not one, but two separate commissions of inquiry, one for the Dardanelles, the other for Mesopotamia. The Mesopotamia Commission opened proceedings on the 21st of August, 1916. Over the next 10 months, the commission held 60 meetings before producing its report. The resulting document was so damning of both the cabinet and the government of India that the politicians delayed publications for two months. By Chilcot standards, this was a short period of time, <laughs> but they sat on it for two months. I regret to have to say, Lord Curzon concluded, that a more shocking exposure of official blundering and incompetence has not, in my opinion, been made at any rate since the Crimean War. The report of the Mesopotamian Commission, Commission was published on June 27, 1917, and heatedly debated in Parliament the following week. The Secretary of State for India, Austin Chamberlain, tendered his resignation as a result. Ironically, by the summer of 1917, Baghdad was already in British hands, captured in the cover photograph of my book cover, conquered by General Stanley Maud in March of 1917. But that delayed victory would not bring back the 40,000 men lost in the mismanaged Mesopotamia campaign up to the fall of Kut. Their sacrifice, like the dead and wounded of Gallipoli, had served not to bring the great war to an end, but rather to prolong that conflict. But we should remember, one century on, the valor and the sacrifice of the soldiers of the Mesopotamia campaign from both sides of the trenches not to score political points, but to avoid sending servicemen and women to battle for political gains in future. Thank you. Well, that was a really gripping lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Eugene. Um, we have time for a few questions. Okay. There are roving mics. If you'd raise a hand, if you'd like to ask a question, and then wait till the mic reaches you, please. I was interested in the position of General Townshend uh, and the way he retired to, to, to Constantinople. I mean, has he ever been investigated as to why? I mean, he lived in great luxury, didn't he, in, in Istanbul, to Constantinople? It's a very good question. The... Treatment that Townshend received would be normal for a commanding officer taken prisoner of war. He was taken with full military honors, 
His sword was restored to him by the Ottomans, and, um, and he was held in the Prince's Islands for the duration of the war. That would not have caused the scandal that it caused had the common soldiers of Kut not faced such a terrible fate. They were, in the most part, separated Indian soldiers and British soldiers. The British soldiers were treated to marches across terrain where they would not be expected to survive. Those who did survive were put into labor gangs. The mortality rate among common British soldiers, I think, was 60% of those who survived Kut to go into British, into Ottoman uh, prison of war camp. Our figures for Indian soldiers is slightly different, and Indian Muslim soldiers are actually given quite good treatment by the Ottomans. But it was against that background that Townshend's relative luxury was seen as a shame, and he was seen as almost a collaborator for having accepted the hospitality of the Ottomans, when, as I said, that would have been the normal way to treat a senior commander taken prisoner the way he was. He uh, tried to leverage his relations with the Ottomans when it came time for an armistice, and so he was drawn to Mudros as part of the mediation between the British, victorious British, and the defeated Ottomans in October. But at that point, the British really weren't looking to Townshend to, um, to, to play such a role. He would spend the rest of his days trying to clear his reputation of the stain of having enjoyed luxury in the aftermath of his defeat in, uh, in Mesopotamia. Personally, my sympathies go to Townshend. I feel like he was a uh, reluctant fighter. His own judgment was to reinforce well-secured British positions. He saw the advances of the Tigris as a grave danger. He was, he was forced to do so by superior commanders. And I think it was wrong to sort of saddle him with undue responsibility for the suffering that, that resulted from the failure of Kut. The, there are a couple of articles in Middle Eastern studies for, I can't remember, they, I'll give you my email. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, on the, on the, but I think also Townsend came in for serious fire for the attempted armistice negotiations for which he had no authority from HMG to engage in, in these negotiations. I think it's a great shame, incidentally, that those negotiations failed because there were people on the Turkish side who wanted to sign an armistice. Uh, so this would have been in 1917. Absolutely. But Bill, I'm going to ask you to surrender the mic just because I can see there Sorry. are more hands and I yeah. want to make sure questioners get their chance yeah. to ask their questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, German officers and advisors were very active at Gallipoli. Were there any, did they play a similar role in this uh, sector or not? The, the senior most German officer in Mesopotamia was von der Goltz. And I confess my own ignorance of German, which has meant that in my own work, I had not really done full justice to the German sources on the Ottoman front. But my understanding was that um, the, the caution that von der Goltz would like to have imposed on Nuruddin Pasha, or Nuruddin Bey, uh, the, the, the fighting general overlooked. And it was his initiative, while von der Goltz was inspecting the Persian front, that led to the attack on Christmas Eve on British positions in Kut. When von der Goltz returned, it was a major difference of opinion between Ottoman and German commanders. It was the kind of disagreement between the Ottomans and the German allies that so often soured relations between the allies. And we, we find many instances of Ottoman commanders chafing under what they thought was a kind of... Uh, racist and arrogant uh, German attempt to tell them how to do things. I think the Germans found the Ottomans uh, using bad judgment and wished that they would do things more by the book. There was, I think, uh, something of a cultural clash between the Allies in that regard. But I, I, I'm not entirely in mastery of the German sources to do justice to your question. How well did the British handle Ottoman prisoners of war? British treatment of Ottoman prisoners of war was fairly exemplary. They reported on their treatment to the International Committee of the Red Cross, and those reports are in public domain and are readily accessible on the internet. I kept picking them up to see how, what they were doing to propagandize 
among Muslim prisoners of war to try and win them over to the Hashemite fight in the Hejaz. And so the one thing you might criticize the British for was that they were engaging in practices rather similar to what the Germans did in creating a special prisoner of war facility for Muslim prisoners near Berlin, and then using that facility to propagandize and try and win uh, volunteers for the Ottoman Jihad effort. The British were trying to do the same thing with Muslim soldiers for the Arab revolt, uh, and I suppose in that were exploiting prisoners of war. But other than that, they were given clean clothing, access to uh, facilities to bathe, they were given clean bedding, they were given full medical treatment, and they were given healthy food. And this, by report, submitted to the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, I think Miss Pell, she was very powerful at that period. She wrote her book, uh, her memories. I wonder whether you read her book or not. Thank you. Whose, whose book is this? Gertrude Bell. I mean, I, I've read a number of Gertrude Bell's works, but she never wrote a book specifically on the First World War period. She traveled through the region extensively before the war. And then, of course, her letters about her work in British service during and after the war have been extremely influential and used by her, um, her biographers. But, um, I mean, I, I don't know that Gertrude Bell had much to add to this phase of the conflict. Her role became much more prominent uh, in the latter period of the British occupation of Mesopotamia, as they began to think of the political future of the country, Gertrude Bell stood out as being far more in line with the thinking of the Arab Bureau in Cairo. She was much more sympathetic with the likes of Lawrence, uh, thinking that you wanted to work with Arab nationalist forces as allies with the British project in the Middle East. In that, she found herself at odds with those officials of Indian experience who had hoped to import the methods of governance in India to a new Raj in Mesopotamia, epitomized by Arnold Wilson. And I think there's a great story in the aftermath of the British victory, 1918, 1919, of the struggle in vision between these two people, Gertrude Bell and Arnold Wilson. That would make a great movie if one wanted to sort of... Thank you very much. And there's, a, there's another story which also has great resonance still today. Um, that was a tremendous lecture. It was gripping, absorbing, and I learned a great deal, and I, I, I'm sure everyone else did as well. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Eugene. You so much. Thank you all.